Lucius Cornelius Sulla was the man responsible for the single-handed capture of Numidia's King Jugurtha, which brought Gaius Marius's war in Numidia to a successful close in 104 BC. Though Marius, as commander of the Numidian theatre, would claim a credit for concluding the war in Africa, it was Sulla's trickery and understanding of human nature which led him to manipulate the betrayal of King Jugurtha in 105 BC. In secrecy, and with only a few guards as escorts, Sulla left Numidia for the neighbouring kingdom of Mauritania. Arriving, Sulla rode into the town of Jugurtha's father-in-law, Mauritania's king Bocchus. Jugurtha, lured to Mauritania by his wife's father, was promptly handed over to Sulla, and a substantial portion of Numidian territory was promptly handed back to King Bocchus as payment. But, the capture of Jugurtha, which immediately ended the war in Numidia, would mark the beginning of Sulla's feud with Marius. Like the Caesars, Sulla's house, though impeccably patrician, was utterly impoverished. Unlike the Caesars, who even during hard times, maintained the dignity and respectability emblematic of their patrician class, Sulla spent his youth among Rome's worst element, actors, dancers, musicians, and prostitutes. Through this misspent youth, Sulla developed a keen understanding of the more base instincts which drove the average person, irrespective of class. Then Sulla's fortunes changed. A wealthy, plebeian woman with whom Sulla was involved died, bequeathing everything she owned to him. This was followed shortly after by the death of Sulla's stepmother, who also left him everything. This timely double inheritance from these two women allowed Sulla to finally take his first steps into public life, though the convenient timing of their deaths would later be questioned by Sulla's political enemies. Then, as Marius had done, Sulla married a Julia of his own, a second cousin of Marius's wife. It is likely this shared family connection to the Julii Caesares was a contributing factor to Sulla's placement as quaestor to the staff of Gaius Marius during the latter's command of the Numidian War. After Rome's annihilation at Arasio, and Marius's unprecedented second consulship, Sulla returned to Rome where he continued working under Marius to rebuild Rome's depleted legions. But, because Rome was in the dark as to where and when the Germans might attack next, Sulla undertook the gathering of intelligence on the Germans with another of Marius's questors, Quintus Sertorius. Though the historians tell us the role Sertorius played in this spying campaign, they are not as forthcoming in regards to the exact details of Sulla's involvement. Like Sertorius, Sulla may have grown his hair and beard long, learned the tongue, and lived among the Germans. Or, he may have remained on the Horde's periphery, acting as the contact point for Sertorius. We know only that Sulla gave nearly two years of his life to this espionage campaign. By the time Sulla and Sertorius returned from their spying campaign, the Roman people had gone on with their lives. Marius was busy building roads and repairing aqueducts, and the conservative Senate seemed to have successfully convinced the populace that Marius had exaggerated the German threat so as to remain in power. But, upon receiving the report that the Germans were preparing for a coordinated attack of Italy on three fronts, the Roman people quickly confirmed Marius in another consulship. Before marching to Aqua Sextii, modern-day Provence, Sulla, for unknown reasons, transferred to the staff of the co-consul, Catulus. As quester to Catulus, Sulla marched to Tridentum, modern-day Trent, to face the Cimbri, who were expected to attack under King Boiorix. Though Gaius Marius enjoyed a stunning victory over King Teutobod at Aqua Sextii, Sulla's experience in Tridentum went quite differently. Catulus realized, much too late, that his army was badly positioned. As the Persians had done to Leonidas's Spartans during the Battle of Thermopylae, the Cimbri used the footpaths in the mountains above to gain leverage over Catulus's army. In response, Sulla created a retreat plan. Rome's auxiliary troops, made up of Italian Samnites, were tasked with engaging the Germans while the brunt of the army retreated back across the river Athesis. The military legate who was put in charge of the Samnite auxiliaries was the son of Rome's princeps senatus, Marcus Aemilius Scorus. Unfortunately, the younger Scorus lacked his father's fearlessness. In the midst of battle, he froze, unable to lead his troops. A Samnite private by the name of Petrius, stepped up and took charge against the Cimbri. Because of Petrius's actions, the army, along with most of the Samnite legions, successfully made it across the Athesis River. The architects were then ordered to demolish the bridge, slowing down the Cimbri's advance into Italy. Petrius, whose actions saved not only his unit, but the whole of Catulus's army, was awarded the Corona Graminea, or Grass Crown. This was the highest signal honour given within the Roman military. It was a crown woven from the blood-stained grass of the battlefield, awarded to the man whose single-handed bravery had saved the lives of an entire unit. 
It had been awarded only five times in Rome's long history, and Petrius was the grass crown's sixth recipient. With the Cimbri's invasion of Italy drastically slowed at the Athesis, Gaius Marius had enough time to bring his victorious legions from Aqua Sextii, and combine them with the army of Catulus. Together, the two generals wiped out the last of the Cimbri. At long last, the German threat was eliminated, Gaius Marius had saved Rome. In the aftermath following Marius's sixth term as consul, and the Senate's battle against the demagogues, Saturninus and Glaucia, Marius had proven to all that he was no politician. He had been politically manoeuvred into a corner, forcing him to turn on his allies and side with the Senate. Marius, it seemed, was successful only when at the head of an army. And though Sulla had fought alongside Marius throughout the Numidian campaign and German invasion, Sulla was a conservative at heart. The Cornelius name was as ancient and patrician as that of any Fabius or Caesar, and despite assisting Marius's political agenda, Sulla found himself sympathetic to the old senatorial families struggling to protect Rome's Mos Maiorum from utter destruction by Marius and his populares. The division between the Optimates and the populares had widened into a chasm, the tide had turned. The elite patricians of the Senate were fast losing ground in their struggles against the rise of new men with new ideas. For Sulla, it was time to tiptoe out from under the overpowering shadow cast by Gaius Marius.